Hey guys and welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for today's lecture we are going to continue right where we left off. In our last lecture we we uh, last discussed the completion of redemption by the uh, Redeemer Democrats and the former slave states, bringing an end to reconstruction. Uh, we also looked at the compromise or the corrupt bargain of 1877. That saw Rutherford B. Hayes uh, gained the presidency in return for promising to withdraw all federal troops from the uh, last three uh, states under Reconstruction governments. Um, and we also saw uh, that there was a shift in the priorities of the Republican Party, uh, the party that, that had been founded for uh, really opening up economic opportunities and also um, continuing the, uh, the fight to abolish slavery and to um, prohibit slavery from the territory. They had seen uh, slavery prohibited from the not just the territory but in the entire nation. They had seen slavery abolished and they had at first attempted to form a uh, solid voter base in the former slave states using uh, free state migrants, free state and free territory migrants known as carpetbaggers to uh, their, their opponents. In addition with uh, local uh, former slave state, state sympathizers known as Scalawags to their enemies. Uh, in addition to the large African American population that was down there, uh, that policy has largely failed in the face of Redeemer violence and uh, general antipathy, uh, a lot of uh, apathy uh, directed towards the uh, the victims of Redeemer violence. Um, so we have seen their uh, their attempt to uh, to build a, a solid base nationwide fail. And with that, they shifted their priority to exclusively focusing on uh, on addressing union veterans uh, and other um, and other groups in the free states, abandoning the uh, the African Americans in the in the former slave states to uh, whatever the to the uh, Redeemer Democrats. And with that, uh, with that brief recap, we'll dive right into our next lecture. Now, our next lecture deals with industrialization, and we'll take oh about four or five lectures to uh, to really dive into industrialization and what industrial uh, and the um, the benefits and the problems that industrial uh, and mass industrialization brought to the Republic um, so to begin with in the late 19th century um, American industrialists like John D Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie built huge corporations that grew both using vertical and horizontal integration. Now these businesses uh, grew so large that they soon began to dominate large segments of the republic's economy. The business magnates of this era were daring individuals who were intensely interested in seizing any opportunity that they could. They were also highly idealistic about using philanthropy to make the world a better place. Now these men built nationwide networks, uh, marketing networks, that capitalized on the huge reserves of iron, oil, and coal deposits that were just now being exploited by the United States. With the aid of a cadre of talented inventors like Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison, the Republic began to improve its manufacturing capabilities. Now, this event came together to enable the United States to emerge by the end of the 19th century, by, by the century's end, as one of the world's great industrialized powers. Now, the small and large-scale production of metal goods was nothing new. Uh, various peoples by the 19th century had long established traditions of working with uh, of working with and making tools weapons jewelry all sorts of goods and vital necessities for metals various metals uh, iron working had been on the rise in the United States since the late colonial period with increased mechanization and need to the railroad industry uh, fueling uh, fueling its rise now, steel demand, though, was very low. Steel, at the time, was very costly to make, so its use was limited to the likes of swords and knives, mainly. In the early 19th century, though, British industrialists began to escalate the scale at which goods were being produced. In 1851, an industrialist, an inventor, really, named Henry Bessemer, came up with a solution to manufacture steel more economically and in larger quantities. Steel production had been a very uh, cost prohibitive, as I said before. 
the United States was very well suited to take full advantage of these improvements that Bessemer uh, pioneered. The United States had all the three key raw ingredients needed to make coal, uh, needed to make steel. They had large amounts of coal, large amounts of limestone, and of course, iron ore, vast deposits of iron ore. Pennsylvania, in particular, had a very, had, uh, it still has very massive, very big deposits of iron ore and large coal fields. Uh, Pennsylvania was well suited to become the home of the surging uh, steel industry. It, however, um, it, however, uh, was the entrepreneurs who increased the scale and efficiency of steel production, with Andrew Carnegie being the most famous or infamous of them all. Now, Carnegie immigrated from Scotland as a boy. Uh, his father had been a hand loom weaver and had lost his job due to increased mechanization in the British textile industry. The family relocated to Allegheny, Pennsylvania, where Carnegie found early work performing odd jobs on the text in the, in the uh, textile industry. Now, Carnegie also worked for Western Union and the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, rising to managerial positions with both companies. Now, Carnegie, Carnegie's early business ventures were devoted to market speculation, but after the Civil War, Carnegie struck out and decided to specialize in the rising steel industry. Uh, Carnegie was one of the most capable business organizers of his day. Uh, he wasn't very knowledgeable about the steel industry itself. He didn't really have any hands-on um, knowledge uh, about working with um, any uh, of doing any of the uh, the actual hands-on work in converting iron ore into smelted ore uh, and turning that smelted ore into steel. He didn't know anything about that. Uh, he was. Um, only uh, really uh, interested and really the, uh, the only part of the business that he really was a driving force in was organization of it and business tactics. Uh, he introduced innovations, uh, many innovations in the daily running of his factories. He used very thrifty means uh, and he managed to avoid the accumulation of excess debt. Uh, and he was very, um, he was very uh, keen to keep uh, cash on hand to protect himself and his business from the turbulence of the business cycle. Now, Carnegie was a true, was a, uh, true genius in the times of uh, recessions when the cost of goods were low. Um, that, that's where his genius really, really, uh, really flowed, really showed itself. He expanded his holdings by acquiring his competitors who were either unable to compete or were too deep into debt. Now, in 1875, Tom, uh, Carnegie opened the Edgar Thompson Works. Now, the Edgar Thompson Works um, was named after Edgar Thompson, who was at that time the head of, a, of the uh, local um, railroad company. It was done as a um, sort of tongue-in-cheek market employee by Carnegie, who anticipated that Thompson, uh, uh, as the head of that company, would become a major customer of his steel works and so he wanted to sort of uh, brown note if you will a little bit now the Edgar Thompson works with a fully integrated steel factory um, uh, located in Pennsylvania and his primary customer the the, the primary um, group the, the primary or organization that Carnegie wanted to serve it was the Pennsylvania Railroad Company headed by as I said it earlier Edgar Thompson now in this factory uh, Carnegie made the rails for uh, not just the Pennsylvania Railroad Company but for all of the local um, companies in Pennsylvania and some in Ohio. It was the largest and uh, fully integrated production-wide factory in the world at the time. Every step of the steel production was done there in the, fa uh, in the factory with raw iron ore coming in and finished steel going out. By the end of the century, this one factory, uh, the Edgar Thompson Works, was manufacturing over 300 tons of rails per day. Uh, Carnegie used very strong bureaucratic means to oversee every aspect of his company. Uh, he knew that he knew uh, what was being produced and how much it cost to be produced. Under Carnegie, the Pennsylvania steel industry moved from the eastern portion of the state to the western portion of the state uh, to be closer to the iron sources. Now, Carnegie was also noted 
for being a very shrewd modernizer. Every time a new innovation came out, he adapted all of his factories, even though doing so was extremely expensive. It was an enormous cost uh, to update all of his factories. Now, this eager desire to embrace new technology explains how Germany and the United States were able to bridge the gap and begin to eclipse Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain had been the first to uh, industrialize, but they had also been very reluctant to update their their uh, their machinery to uh, to update their um their, their factories. They had said that these work great. They've only been uh, they've been uh, working great for 20 years. They work great for another 20 years or more. Uh, as soon as something new came out, Carnegie had to get it. He had to have it. Um, Carnegie uh, also abandoned the ad hoc trial and error approach to the steel industry. Uh, he was one of the first to employ chemists and physics uh, to oversee the aspects of his business that he could not comprehend. Um, like as I mentioned before, the chemical process of turning, of, uh, turning uh, iron ore into steel. Now, Carnegie, despite his reputation, um, paid his managers really well. Bill Jones, for example, was paid uh, exceptionally well. Uh, when Jones asked for a raise, he was given one. Carnegie really didn't haggle over paying his employees. Um, uh, the raise that, uh, that, that Bill Jones got was uh, about $25,000, which at the time was the same amount that the president made a year. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, Carnegie was so shrewd in his dealing with his business managers and his senior employees that he was also known to give them stock in his company uh, as a means of binding them to the company. Now, Jones. Uh, Carnegie was able to bind Jones so effectively to the company that Jones went ahead and... Um, pioneered a method, um, well really a machine, the Jones Mixer. Um, by 1900, Carnegie's uh, company was producing uh, as much steel as Great Britain um, was producing. Uh, his, his one company, uh, equaling uh, the amount that an entire nation, an entire kingdom was doing. Um, he was able to do this because of the incredible place of mechanization had that stated earlier. Now Jones, uh, invented the Jones Mixer, and the Jones Mixer eliminated the cost in steel production. Uh, steel manufacturing had been a two-step process. First, you had to smelt the iron out of the ore, creating rot or pig iron, and rot or pig iron is very brittle. Um, then you would have to carry the pig iron to a converter to be smelted again and turned into steel. The Jones mixer reduced the cost related to heating and reheating the iron by keeping the iron in a liquid or molten state until it could be sent into the Bessemer converter. Now, after, 18, uh, after the 1890s, demand for rails began to subside in the United States. Um, and Carnegie began to turn to other industries to make up for the demand. Uh, steel ships, uh, building uh, ships in steel rose after, uh, after about 1890. So Carnegie, uh, seeing the opportunity, quickly expanded his business, uh, providing steel for their purposes because of the decline in the steel for, for steel in the railroad industry. Uh, and with the new discoveries of iron ore in Minnesota's Misabi Range, he he took the initiative again, uh, putting in place um, a system to go ahead and retrieve that ore from the Misabi Range. Uh, now, the, the ore itself was a... Um, Ma the ore was mined in uh, the Masabi Range, which is um, uh, in like uh, marshy river uh, riverlands close to Lake Superior. And indeed, uh, Carnegie would have the ore transported from Duluth on Lake Superior through Lakes Huron and Erie to its Pittsburgh factories. Uh, Carnegie shifted to an open hearth method uh, despite the great cost because the ore being extracted from the Misabi range was it's very high in phosphorus and not well suited for the Bessemer converter. So again, uh, you see his sort of uh, drive for innovation, his sort of drive uh, to meet the demands of the industry. Many people um, who already had uh, quite expensive machinery in place would have said that, well, uh, we're not going to use that iron ore coming from the Masabi range. It's going to be too expensive to replace. Carnegie went ahead and converted them anyway uh, because this was a very large um, iron ore uh, 
they would do for very uh, huge deposits of iron ore there, and he wanted to capitalize on it, so he just went ahead and uh, converted his factory so that he could better exploit those uh, those newfound sources of iron. Now Carnegie, uh, Carnegie's company merged to form the United Steel Company in 1901. Uh, United States Steel Company or U.S. Steel. Um, U.S. Steel was the first corporation to be valued over one billion dollars. Now the deal was brokered by Charles Schwab, who worked for Carnegie, and Albert Gary. Now Albert Gary is the namesake of the town of Gary, Indiana, and at the time he was the president of the Federal Steel Company. Uh, now the corporation, uh, U.S. Steel, included the Carnegie Company, Federal Steel, American Steel and Wire, National Tube Company, the National Steel Hoop Company, American Tin Plate Company, American Steel Plate, and American Bridge Company. Now Carnegie retired shortly after the merger and embarked on a philanthropic career, um, which included the founding of the Carnegie Foundation. Now. Now, uh, before he retired, uh, Carnegie again switched his focus uh, to producing steel girders for skyscrapers. At this time, uh, at the dawn of the 20th century, skyscrapers were becoming a very permanent, uh, very major feature on the American landscape, on the American urban landscape. Uh, under Carnegie, steel production in the United States rose from just under 20 tons a year at the end of the Civil War to approximately 10 million tons at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, so in roughly the span of about 30, 35 years, you see that dramatic, that dramatic, that really drastic increase in the production. Um, and today, uh, Carnegie's company, the Carnegie Company, is a core component of U.S. steel. Now, Carnegie with the more prominent steel manufacturer but he had uh, but he had to contend with major rivals uh, steel companies grew in Chicago Maryland and Alabama uh, Carnegie was able to dominate the Pittsburgh area and really um, most of the Great Lakes area but he never attained the dominance that Rockefeller John D Rockefeller had attained in the oil industry um, Carnegie's really a paradoxical figure uh, he pioneered the uh, the most infamous aspects of the robber baron practices but he also set the standard for future generations of philanthropists and with that being said we'll break here uh, and we'll come back with uh, and we'll continue on with John D. Rockefeller and the oil industry in part two of our lecture series on industrialization and as always I'm Ted hit like subscribe and comment and let me know what you thought about this lecture let me know what you thought about Carnegie uh, and its impact on the US steel business um, and I'll see you guys next time for another lecture